give a, a lecture here for 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes or so on metabolic engineering. For the last um, two and a half, maybe two years or so, he's been working on exploring the use of metabolic uh, models for um, metabolic engineering and actually done a deep dive into the literature, uh, looked at the 80 or so different designs uh, that are actually intuitively arrived at many of them as being growth coupled, but he's also analyzed them with uh, uh, the computer model and is uh, merging the two. And uh, he has uh, a great set of slides and observations on this uh, that he went through with us yesterday. So I thought it would be maybe better that he come here today than Adam. So uh, Zach has the uh, prestigious uh, NSF fellowship and is here now in what your third year, but he's cool. Fourth. Fourth, okay. Yeah. You're on. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for doing this for us. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, okay, so uh, like Dr. Paulson said, I'm a fourth year uh, graduate student in the Systems Biology Research Group, and I recognize a lot of you guys. Um, so I'm going to be telling you about growth coupled fermentation, which I'm proposing we can use this, and it has been used as a strategy for a sort of automated cell design. And if you have any specific questions on terminology or um, concepts that don't sound familiar right away, feel free to ask me because uh, so we can relate this to what you've been learning all quarter. And uh, so let's begin. Okay, so to start um, to incentivize all this work, uh, it, it helps to look at the, the major challenges if you uh, are interested in metabolic engineering and synthetic biology. And um, basically, organisms are evolved to meet natural objectives. Um, and so if you want to achieve a synthetic objective, then this is a multifaceted challenge. And these, uh, the challenges associated with synthetic biology were laid out a few years ago um, in a news article in Science. So you can kind of, they pulled out five of these, um, what they called hard truths for synthetic biology. So five major challenges that face anybody who wants to redesign an organism. Um, many of the parts in a cell are undefined. The circuitry is often unpredictable. Um, the complexity is unwieldy. unwieldy. We're working with complex systems at many scales. The, many of the parts that we put in these organisms are incompatible. And variability in the system can, can crash the behavior that we're interested in. And so if you have a cell that's um, evolved to meet a natural objective, then a lot of these problems are kind of accomplished via the process of evolution, but if we're looking at a synthetic objective, then we have to start dealing with each of these hard truths. <clears throat> so the question today is, what if we can harness predictive models, genome scale models, and laboratory evolution to start solving these uh, types of challenges for us? Um, so the first concept to introduce is, is growth coupled fermentation, which you may have come across this quarter. If not, um, the first industrial fermentations go back to the first beer production, which may have started as early as 7000 BC. And so if, you, if you're in the process of uh, designing a new beer, the um, yeast that you put in your wort happens to be growth coupled to ethanol production. So naturally during evolution it will produce ethanol. And so the, the uh, brewers back then had no idea what was going on. They didn't even know that microorganisms existed. but the natural objective was equal to the human objective. And so they were able to use this industrial fermentation process to achieve their synthetic goals. Um, now we're in the age of engineered fermentation where the natural objective no longer equals the, the um, synthetic objective. We want to engineer organisms for new creative objectives. And to do this, we use a lot of molecular biology. E. coli has been the, the workhorse organism. Um, and it turns out it's been growth coupled to a large variety of products in the last 30 years. And laboratory evolution, kind of recreating that natural process in the laboratory, um, has allowed uh, strain engineers to optimize these strains and achieve these uh, synthetic objectives. So the story of growth coupled fermentation in this modern era begins with trying to make the molecule lactate. Um, so if you read through the literature, you see tons and tons of papers where people are interested in lactate. Uh, so how does that work? Natural fermentation in E. coli is a mixed acid fermentation. So optimally under 
Um, anaerobic conditions are conditions where there's no uh, external electron acceptor, oxygen or nitrate. Um, the cell will run glycolysis and then to regenerate uh, NAD to continue running glyco glycolysis, it can't use the um, oxidative phosphorylation route, so it has to ferment products that serve as electron acceptors. And the ideal mix here is um, an even mix of ethanol and acetate as the major products, and then E. coli will also make some formate, some uh, lactate and succinate as uh, byproducts. Now, if you, um, it was shown in 1989, this was one of the first uh, key papers where they did growth coupled fermentation, that if you take out the genes that um, are critical for the pathways to ac acetated ethanol, then lactate shows up as the major secretion product at high yields, greater than 80% yield. So this is a huge effect with just two gene knockouts, and it's robust to evolution. Um, so quickly, why does that happen? Why would you go from making acetate and ethanol to immediately high yields of uh, lactate? Well, the key point is that ATP that I circled in red there, the acetate and ethanol route produces an extra ATP compared to the lactate route. So if you're just looking at the stoichiometry, the mass balance of the system under these two fermentation uh, modes, the acetate and ethanol mode produces an extra ATP. The cell can grow a little faster. Um, so it's a fairly simple thing conceptually, but then it becomes very powerful um, in, the, in the experiment because uh, a lot of what you would have to do with the cell to make a lactate producing strain, the cell just does it for you with these two knockouts. Um, so lactate production is the next highest yield solution behind the natural products. And 16 years later, after this initial study, in our lab, uh, Steve Fong showed that if you take the same design the same um, PTA and ADHE knockout, and <clears throat> you build that strain in E. coli and then you let it evolve, the evolution will actually track um, the predictions of a genome scale model. And so this is a production envelope you might have come across these this quarter. On the x-axis you have growth rate, on the y is lactate production, and then these uh, shaded envelopes represent the solution space. And as the PTA ADHE knockout grows, it moves towards the edge of that envelope over this 50-day evolution. Um, and the, the main result of that is that we can predict growth-coupled fermentation. And uh, so genome scale models are built to predict the highest yield metabolic flux state based on the stoichiometry of the system. And this is also the evolutionary objective. Um, so then as a secondary step in silico, we can start to build optimization procedures to try to find the genotype or the set of gene knockouts that would force growth coupling of a particular target. So now that we know that we can predict the phenotype, what if we can also modify the genotype for a target phenotype? Um, and the first of these algorithms is called OpNoc. It came out in 2003 and it's led to a whole slew of follow-up uh, methods. OpGene, GDLS, OpStream, RobustNoc, OpSwap, GenPath, OxNoc, and many others. This is just a subset. Um, now, to compare these two uh, cases, there's a lot of classic papers that demonstrate that we can predict a phenotype. So, um, like I said, we, we feel that the, or we've shown that the genome scale models uh, can recapitulate the observations that we see in a cell. And a couple of those classic papers um, are shown here, but there's um, probably dozens of, of really good, interesting demonstrations of the predictive power genome scale models. However, for these growth coupled predictions, so using OpNoc and the other um, uh, growth coupled prediction algorithms, there's really been only two papers that have shown that if you take one of these algorithms and you run your simulations and you pick some uh, gene knockout designs, uh, validate that that happens in an evolutionary experiment. Um, and so those two papers, the first one was the um, Steve Fong paper from 2005 looking at delactate production, and the second one came out in 2011 um, from Genomatica showing that 1,4 butane diol production can be growth coupled. And, um, but what I didn't mention here is that, the, you know, there's a, 
clearly a lot of papers looking at the uh, in silico predictions of genome scale models for fermentation. Um, and there's also, in parallel, a lot of papers on the experimental growth coupling. Um, but these two uh, courses of inquiry have really proceeded in parallel, and there hasn't been a lot of crosstalk, or at least a publication on integrating the in silico approaches and the experimental approaches. And so that's really the goal of this work, is to try and bring those two, um, those two bodies of, of work together. Uh, so this paper, first I review the use of laboratory evolution uh, to optimize growth coupled strains. Um, so this is the experimental side of things. How has E. coli been engineered? Uh, what have been the results of those laboratory evolutions? And then do an analysis taking those um, uh, experimental results and start to compare them to our genome scale models. Uh, talk about roles, strengths, and weaknesses for the models. Uh, I look at the predictions of these designs across six historical E. coli models so we can get a sense of the trajectory of our prediction power over time. I uh, try to pull out the main failure modes in the models and ask how good are the newest models. In fact, we have a new generation of models that incorporate metabolism with the expression machinery of a cell. Uh, so the question is, does that extra set of capabilities add any predictive power for uh, growth couple designs? And then at the end, try and bring that together to generate a proposal for how to do automated strain design in an era where we have predictive models we have the ability to run evolution experiments in the lab. And ask, uh, finally, can our new proposal address one or many of those hard truths for synthetic biology that we pulled out at the beginning? So, beginning with the uh, literature review. Um, to start, we collected all the strains that pursued a growth-coupled engineering strategy. So what is a growth-coupled strategy? It's basically what I showed you just a second ago any paper where they knock out the alternative fermentation routes in order to um, incite growth of the target pathway. Uh, so we don't know ahead of time if those strains are necessarily growth coupled if they haven't performed a robust evolution study, um, but at least the authors are trying to growth couple their strain. And so this is a, a pictorial representation of the um, papers that I've collected. So it's uh, around 65 papers, and the first papers came out in the late 80s, and we're looking at products that were similar to native fermentation products. So, um, homo fermentation of ethanol and then lactate, and then um, around 97, the first uh, succinate growth coupled strains came out, and succinate's an important industrial molecule, and so there's been a ton of interest in succinate over the past uh, 15 years. And then recently there's been a divergence uh, of the targets that people are interested in addressing a lot of uh, non-native pathways. So if you, if you take the native system, now you know you can growth couple part of you know, whatever target you want, you start putting uh, non-native pathways in the cell and remove the native fermentation routes, now you have a fermenter of a, um, a new target. So for instance, uh, PHB, um, 1,4-BDO is an example of this, the butane diol strain that I talked about a second ago. Um, and, you know, you can see there's about uh, 17, 18 targets here that people have been lo looking at. So it's a pretty diverse, um, a diverse set of uh, for growth couple strains. And we can look at those in terms of the metabolic map of E. coli. So I showed you the uh, native metabolism earlier, and then the non-native targets in blue are um, drawing from certain precursor molecules. So a lot of them are drawing from the acetyl-CoA node. Um, and however, there's certain exceptions, so like 1,4-butane diol is produced from succinate and alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, and so a, a question to ask here is, is there any overlap between the targets that have been looked at experimentally and the targets that have been looked at in silico, because um, there's a couple large-scale in silico studies that try and growth couple lots and lots of targets, at least, and see, see what the model says. And so we can compare the native products in orange to a study that was done in 2010 from this lab by Adam Feist, where Adam tried to growth couple all of the native metabolites in the um, 
at the time the latest uh, genome scale model of E. coli, which is IAF1260. And here is the final, um, the final figure from his 2010 paper. And what this is showing is as you increase the number of knockouts, what is the theoretical yield that you can achieve in a growth coupled strain? And then on the right side, I've colored in pink the knockouts that, or the targets that he looked at that show up in our literature analysis. So ethanol, lactate, pyruvate, succinate, and alanine have all actually been growth coupled experimentally. Um, and the only ones that he showed in silico that haven't gone after experimentally are AKG, fumarate, and glycerol. So maybe those would be good targets um, for future experimental studies to be interested in. And then Adam in silico also didn't address um, hydrogen formate, L-lactate, and malate. So those would be interesting ones to try to look at in a simulation. And so coming back to this picture, we can do the same kind of uh, uh, large-scale comparison for the non-native pathways in blue. And just last year, uh, Miguel uh, Campadonico, who was a, he's a grad student from Chile, he visited our lab for two years and he put together an algorithm which he called uh, GenPath that could predict, um, it was a, a pathway prediction algorithm. So starting with a native uh, E. coli metabolic network, pick any number of targets and then try to generate all the possible routes, um, all the possible pathways to those targets using, uh, in this case, CAG, a large database of possible biochemical reactions. And um, as a second step, he took all of these uh, new predicted pathways and then generated growth couple designs for those. And so I've taken his um, final figure from his paper, and in this case, each dot on this figure is a growth couple design, and then you see different targets around the outside of the circle. And again, in pink are the targets that show up as actual experimentally produced growth couple designs in the literature. Um, so the thing to note here is that the, any one of those um, pi pieces that has a lot of dots is, is one that it seems like we could definitely produce a growth coupled strain for, at least uh, predicted. And a lot of those pies correspond to experimentally validated uh, growth coupled designs. And there's a couple cases, so 3 hydroxypropanoate, acrylic acid, and acrylamide, where we can generate a lot of growth coupled predictions, but nobody's actually made those strains. So these would another be a, this is another set of um, interesting targets to for experimentals to, to be looking into. Okay, so all right. So another um, type of analysis of this uh, bibliomic data set, so the set of, of um, articles that we collected is to look at all the gene knockouts that they did. So for every one of these I collected the exact genotype and um, this is a, a plot on the, on the y-axis we see the same set of targets that we did earlier and then on the x-axis is every single gene that anyone has tried to knock out in these studies. Um, and so that we can start to see which genes have been used r very often to perform these kinds of uh, experimental uh, growth couplings. And so the ones that pop up immediately, so the first one is LDHA, which is the lactate dehydrogenase enzyme. And to uh, growth couple anything except lactate, you really want to remove lactate as a route. And so almost every one of these strains removes that LDHA gene. And um, all the orange genes are metabolic enzymes, so those would be in the scope of a metabolic model and something we can predict. The, there's a few um, green genes, those are transcription factors. So we wouldn't be able to predict those in our uh, current models. Um, but this is uh, interesting for anybody doing an in silico study on growth coupling because this can serve as an input of all of the genes that you, would, you might want to try to knock out. So if you're generating a, an algorithm like OpNOC, the, um, the set of reactions that are available to knock out is really important. You have to define that ahead of time. And as you increase the number of reactions that you can knock out, the, um, the time that it takes to, to run your simulations increases, at least linearly. Um, so this is a really uh, key set 
to use as an input for future in silico studies. Okay, so here's a, another way to look at this data set. Uh, these are histograms of, on the top, the, the number of gene knockouts required in these experimental studies to growth couple a product, and then on the bottom, the number of reactions. And so, on average, to, knock, to uh, growth couple a native target, it takes about five and a half, uh, five to six gene knockouts. A non-native target, the average is six. And then, um, when you remove those genes, the number of reactions that are disabled is between seven and eight for both. And then we can compare this, the number of reactions that were removed, to the range of knock, gene reaction knockouts that uh, Adam reported in 2010, which is around one to 10 to growth couple of things in silico. So now that this is another way to show a good alignment between um, the results of the in silico studies and the experimental observations. All right, and so this is a, um, for the metabolic engineers, I think this is a really important result. This is the table of all the um, actual evolutions that were performed in the literature. So um, because these strains are growth coupled, they, those targets, so the phenotype that produces the molecule of choice, should be robust against evolution. In fact, evolution should select for that phenotype. And so if you generate one of these growth coupled strains, and then you pass it sequentially in the laboratory, you should see selection for your phenotype. And indeed, going back to 98, when the first uh, succinate laboratory evolution was done, um, this was observed. And so in that case, there was a loss of function of the PTSG, PTSG gene that led to an increase in substrate uptake rate. And it actually led to a strain that could ferment glucose to only succinate, where the parent strain couldn't ferment glucose, it had to be grown in a rich media. Um, and then that strain was used as a host strain in follow-up experiments. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of examples of this. Uh, acetate was um, growth coupled and evolved, and then that was later used as a host strain for pyruvate production. Um, there's a number of delactate cases, including the one from our group in 2005, and another one for succinate and L-alanine. And in each of these cases, there's a lot of phenotypic effects uh, that are things that you might try to engineer yourself. So, for instance, in the uh, ECOM strain, which was published in 2008, it was seen that there was, um, the effect of evolution was aerobic arc A activation. So there's this big regulatory modification. Um, and this is the kind of thing a metabolic engineer might do. Well, let's try and activate arc A to get the phenotype we want. But in this case, evolution is doing it for you. So it's essentially automated that. Um, engineering process. And then these evolutions were late analyzed in uh, follow-up papers. The whole point here is that laboratory evolution works. Uh, it can give you an interesting phenotype. And it can generate these uh, general mutations that give you kind of general purpose hosts. So potentially, you could take your succinate producer, add some heterologous pathway, say one butanol production, remove the succinate route, and now you have a growth couple one butanol strain. Okay, so that's the um, kind of analysis of what's been done experimentally. And this is, this, in the second part, I want to take individual cases where we compare an uh, experimental strain to the predictions in six genome scale models. And so the first one is to look at essentiality. So here's a, a pretty simple plot. This is taking the experimental designs, simulating them in an in silico model under anaerobic conditions, and asking, or the, sorry, the conditions that were reported in the paper and asking, is that cell going to grow in silico? So we know it grows experimentally, will it grow in silico? And on the x-axis, we have our, um, in this case, this is just the first of five of those six models. We'll talk about the last one in a second. We have the E. coli core model, which is our um, small-scale teaching model. So it's small enough that you should be able to recognize every reaction in the model if you're familiar with E. coli metabolism. And then um, IJR904, IAF1260, a very small change to IAF1260 called IAF1260B, and then the latest genome scale model of E. coli IJO1366. And the trend here is that um, in early models, all the way up to this IAF1260B, half to two thirds of the designs that we observed 
would just kill the cell in silico. So they would be lethal. This is a, um, a pretty major effect, and um, IF-1260 is still used in a lot of uh, papers of um, analyzing genome scale models for E. coli. Um, only recently people started to pick up the latest one, IJ-1366. And um, it turns out there's a pretty clear reason for this. It's only one gene, and the gene is FRD. So um, the long and short of it is if you take one of the older models, and you knock out any of the FRD genes, FRD A through D, uh, that is going to kill a cell in under anaerobic conditions. Uh, but clearly these cells grow, so something else might be going on. In the IF1260B model, a, an extra reaction, this DHORD fume reaction was added, which effectively serves as an isozyme for FRD and alleviates that uh, lethality. Now, that reaction that was added is an orphan reaction. There's no gene associated with it. It's not known whether it actually occurs or not, um, but it was added actually to relieve this very problem. And um, so from my analysis, it looks like it's more likely that succinate hydro dehydrogenase is acting reversibly in the cases where you knock out FRD. Um, but we would have to show that um, it's not 100% positive that this is the case. The point here, though, is that a very small change in the genome scale model can have a very big effect when you're starting to look at predictions of a certain class, right? So we're, we're really interested in growth coupling, really interested in anaerobic conditions. Now, one gene uh, in the model can throw off all of our predictions. And this is an argument for improving our genome scale models. Um, endless gap filling, so constantly trying to find these cases and solve them. Um, and also making sure that we really understand the content of our models and the failure modes. So this is a major failure mode. And there are other cases like this. This is just, FRD is just the main one. Okay, so the second case, the second uh, failure mode of the genome scale models in this uh, data set is isozymes. And uh, basically, low activity isozymes are not represented in the genome scale model. So in, in an organism, you might have um, a major isozyme, the one that catalyzes most of the activity through a reaction, but then you also have other genes in the model that can catalyze that activity at a low rate. Um, and this is a pretty common thing to see, but in a genome scale model, we only represent, basically all genes are related equal. Either it can catalyze a reaction or it can't. And we currently don't have a way to encode that more detailed information in the model directly. And where this pops up and is an issue is, for example, this is a production strain for L-alanine, and it includes a knockout of PFLB and DADX. And so PFLB and PFLA are, um, uh, are catalyzed the reaction PFL, it's the pyruvate formate lyase reaction. And you have to knock out PFL if you want to growth couple L alanine. Uh, but it turns out there's two isozymes in E. coli that are just active at a low rate. And so if you, um, if you do the naive approach and just knock out PFLB in the model, then PFL is still active and the cell won't growth couple L alanine. So you have, to, um, you have to deal with the isozyme in a certain manner in this case, which is you have to knock out all the other isozymes. But in the second case, if you tried to knock out DADX and ALAR, ALR, assuming that you wanted to remove this other reaction, which is kind of a similar case, um, it turns out that the cell dies in silico because that's an essential reaction. It must be present for the cell to grow and produce biomass. So you have to treat these two cases differently. And to know how to treat these two cases, you have to have a fairly deep understanding of the biology. So the goal would be to get that understanding encoded in these models, try and understand mm -hmm. these isotopes. Um, there's an interesting strategy in the literature, incidentally. Um, often, one would remove the major isozyme to hinder but not halt a reaction. So that's what's happening with ALAR. Removing DADX just slows it down. Okay, so a third issue in the models is equivalent solutions. Um, um, so in a specific case, there is this aerobic acetate secretion strain, uh, and there's the uh, genotype. And if you plot the production envelope for IJO, um, 
here it is, the wild type's in blue, the design is in green, and you can see that the design is growth coupled. So to grow at the fastest rate, it has to produce acetate. So the authors took the same strain and then said, let's make pyruvate with that strain. They added two more gene knockouts, and we can draw the production envelope in IGO for that one. And now we see that the design has this, um, what we call a non-unique solution. Basically, the cell can produce lots of pyruvate and grow quickly, or it can produce no pyruvate and grow quickly. And those are completely equivalent in IJO. And so this is where we can add our new uh, latest generation genome scale models, the so-called ME models, which include metabolism and expression. And they have one, uh, say, killer feature, which is that the ME model now applies a cost to every pathway. And I think you guys have come across these this quarter. Um, but by applying a cost to the enzymes in a pathway, uh, it takes away a lot of these equivalent solutions. So a longer pathway is now more expensive than its shorter equivalent pathway. So if the yields are the same, uh, the enzyme cost removes this kind of equivalence between the two pathways. And so on the right side, I'm showing the same variability. So basically from the bottom of the straight line to the top of it, um, the max and the min production at max growth rate across all of the genome scale models. You see all of the um, metabolic models have a very wide uh, range of pyruvate secretion, but that ME model pulls it into a point, meaning pyruvate secretion is exactly growth coupled. And so this is a, a, you know, a, a value that we can add to our predictions using these kind of latest generation fully genome scale models. Um, okay, so another case of the ME model being useful is pathway length. So this is the, uh, these are two pathways. One is to isobutanol, and the other is to hexanoate. Hexanoate is a, a native metabolite, and isobutanol is part of this non-native pathway. And um, putting those into three models, IAF1260, IJO1366, and the new ME model, we see that um, the two M models differ in their predictions because of the reversibility of this reaction and, and the beta oxidation pathway. And um, if you build this strain experimentally, it, it actually growth couples isobutanol. So for some reason, IF1260B and the ME model, uh, ME model are correct, but the one in the middle, IJO, is incorrect. And, but IF and ME are correct for different reasons. IF is correct because this reaction is made irreversible in that model. However, it's been shown in other papers that that reaction should be reversible. So, um, in this case, the biology is better represented in IJO. But then IJO predicts the wrong product. So it turns out that the pathway length may be the reason that isobutanol will be secreted in this case. Hexanoate requires a longer pathway, which would require more enzyme investment. So the shorter pathway actually has less cost in total for the cell. It's the ME model. In this, it, uh, here, the prediction is, is unique in IJO. It's not like the previous one where we showed it was a non-unique solution. Here, it's unique, but incorrect. And any model will choose the correct solution. Um, okay, so those are the four main failure modes that I pulled out for the genome scale models. And this is uh, a fairly unique analysis. It's hard often to pull out major failure modes that haven't been addressed before. Um, so hopefully we can use these failure modes and our new knowledge of what makes genome scale models predictive and, and useful to generate a forward-thinking strategy for designing cells. And that is this proposal. Um, we we want to predict cells using our predictions of growth couple designs and genome scale models. It helps use the latest, largest genome scale models, as I just showed you. Um, we can start with that list of genes that have been knocked out in experimental studies as a seed to generate new designs. Uh, further model improvement can improve predictions, so we should continue to improve our models, because it really helps. Um, and then we can use evolution as a major tool in this cell design strategy. So it turns out evolved strains can act as general hosts when we look at other targets. Um, AL is our acronym for Adaptive Laboratory Evolution, and it can generate key phenotypes, so thereby automating many of these common engineering strategies like regulatory optimization. And then 
generating lots and lots of interesting phenotypes. Um, knockouts, substrate uptake rate increases, tighter rate and yield, which are the main factors if you're interested in metabolic engineering. Um, okay, so then let's apply this to some kind of uh, process. So uh, if we're starting with the target compound, we can ask, is that compound native? If it's a non-native compound, let's add a heterologous pathway for that. And then in blue, let's simulate the phenotype and try to choose the knockouts that would growth couple that design. And as an input to that, we can use the common <coughs> knockout targets from this analysis. So build the, build the strain, measure the secretion of that strain, see if it worked. If our, if our design is still not growth coupled, um, we can use ale to improve the growth of that strain and the growth coupling, um, basically the general growth coupling characteristics of that strain. And then we can do an iterative design loop. So we can do our design, um, build, test, learn loop and gradually um, draw in towards the growth coupled design that we want. And then finally we can, pr uh, at the end we could pr uh, run ale experiments for other selections. So if you have many phenotypes you're interested in, rate, yield, and titer, for instance, you could run ALs for uh, different, one, different uh, target um, optimization functions. Okay, so this is maybe the more traditional way in the papers that I read. Often they add this uh, heterologous pathway at the beginning of the strain design process and then run through this kind of design loop. Um, an alternatives approach would be if you have a target compound, Rather than immediately adding your, a heterologous pathway to produce that compound, first choose a, uh, an alternative uh, native target. So let's say, let's produce a growth coupled succinate strain first. Um, run through the design loop. Now you have a host strain that produces succinate at a high yield and is kind of prepared to basically produce anything that's similar to succinate. And then you add your heterologous path at the end and knock out the host target. And the advantage here is that you have a host strain that you could apply to a whole uh, slew of targets. So um, this is a, you know, a, a somewhat novel approach, but it really draws from the successes in the literature. So that would, that's what would make it stand out. <clears throat> OK, general conclusions here. Um, this is one of the most in-depth model to experiment comparisons that uh, I've seen reported. And so in that sense, it's fairly novel because people, you know, the conferences will ask me, uh, well, let's uh, lay it out this way. There seems to be a poor communication between the experimentalists and the computationalists. And so bridging that gap can be really valuable. Um, and when I have told people that I have this data set, they seem uh, pretty excited to see whether these genome scale models could really affect their experimental work. Um, and another point is that this is, in, in general, of, of an extensive genotype-phenotype comparison. Um, usually we validate our models using essentiality predictions, but that's just one category of validation. So this is a, a, a brand new category of validation. Um, hopefully it's a convincing story that models can predict growth coupled phenotypes, which has also on its own been a question in the past. And we can go back to the table of our hard truths for synthetic biology and see if we were able to meet any of these goals. Um, if many of the parts in the cell are undefined, uh, the beauty of the genome scale model is that we're defining the parts. The circuitry in a cell is often unpredictable. But under growth optimizing conditions, we can predict the phenotype of a cell. The complexity of a cell is unwieldy, so we have m models of metabolism and expression, but there's all these other uh, systems in a cell. However, an adaptive laboratory evolution manages those other systems for us. Um, so it's a way to deal with the complexity without specifically knowing what's happening. Um, we cannot necessarily address this issue of the parts in the cell being incompatible, so that has to be addressed elsewhere. Um, but finally, variability crashes these systems. However, growth coupled phenotypes are uh, selected to be robust. So, um, yeah, so this is the conclusion. If you guys have questions, uh, let me know.